Welcome back to the Hot 790 News. Thank you for staying with us. St. Lucia Carnival continues to crown itself as a superior display of colorful costumes, lively entertainment, and of course, stunning beauty. The highly anticipated reveal of the 2019 Carnival Queen contestants took place on Wednesday night. Eight young ladies have been selected to compete in the June 29 pageant, and from all indications, all eyes are on finding the diamond in the rough. Solange Alfred tells us more. It is without a doubt one of the most highly anticipated activities on the calendar for St. Lucia Carnival, the National Carnival Queen pageant. The unveiling of the eight contestants vying to be crowned Carnival Queen 2019 took place on Wednesday night. It was carried live on the Event St. Lucia Facebook page, where a panel of past Carnival Queens and the reigning Queen called the young ladies live to break the news that they had been selected for the pageant. Marketing and Sponsorship Officer at Events Company St. Lucia, Leela Williams, says the stage is being set for a thrilling competition. She indicated that last year's event set the bar extremely high and this year's crop of young ladies seem up to the task of maintaining the standard. Everybody was just in awe and wow and they were just looking forward and this year we're hoping, we're expecting it is the same. Um, we have a few little things to put in there in terms of marketing to just bring awareness to the event, to the young ladies, to their sponsors and to kind of bolster and to encourage um, the, the excitement because I guess by very nature of the event people are normally excited about it and um, this year in certain pockets we already um, have achieved or, or experienced in that excitement and it's just clear sailing all the way down to the finish line. Head chaperone for the National Carnival Queen pageant and former Queen Louis Victor notes that the road that lies ahead for the Chosen Eight will have many detours, but will be filled with opportunities that they should make the most of. I think going forward we have a pretty good crop um, of girls to work with, and I'm looking forward to seeing what the transformation is um, come June 29th and beyond, and see how they take every experience, every rehearsal, um, every networking opportunity, to ultimately better themselves. Meanwhile, Williams, who used the example of St. Lucia's 2018 Carnival Queen, Erlika Fedrick, says that the art form of pageantry is one that carries a wide range of benefits for all competitors, especially the winner. A number of persons always ask me what is there in it for a young lady to participate in the National Carnival Queen pageant. And I mean apart from prizes, because I mean your prizes come to an end after a while, whether it be a scholarship for three years, whether they be cash or so, it comes to an end. However, the augmentation of your skills is what is what you take with you and what um what puts you on a different level and I can see that with her. She is now a teacher, um and of course uh, with teaching comes a particular um, advancement of your ability to to um, to speak to a crowd, to deliver all of that, and and I noticed that quite a bit in her today. She has moved from the level where she was um, when she came in last year to where she is now, and that's a really really excellent thing. The eight contestants are Jacka Wooding, Shuliana Lamontine, Janille Fontenelle, Justinian Charles, Winnie Vernil. Timika Duterville, Arisa Dennis, and Naomi St. Remy. Reporting for Hot 7 News, I am Solaj Alfred. Thank you, Solaj. The island's Prime Minister says some tough decisions will have to be made where the future of St. Lucia's GDP is concerned. Alan Chastney says our current GDP is not cutting it, and so change is needed to encourage growth. Rochelle Gonzalez reports. Prime Minister Alan Chastney poured his heart out on Thursday morning on the topic of impending changes to the island. The PM said there are moments when his emotions become physical when he looks at the current state of the island. I went to pick up my wife for lunch and um, I happened to be just parked on um, Brazil Street. And I was watching these tourists walk around Derek Walcott Square. And I, was, I, I cried. Cried. Nothing to do. And then I, I looked around Derek Walcott Square, and I said, if this square was in the same prominence of who Derek Walcott was, and that this thing was successful, 
Okay, and that this was a world-class attraction. What you would see around the square is that all of the ground floor positions would be cafes. Because everybody would be clawing for an opportunity to have a cup of coffee or have lunch or have tea and to sit and look at Derek Walcott Square. So the fact that that's not there tells you that we're not fulfilling our mandate. Chastney said Castries is screaming out for help. However, the methods needed to fix the situation are sure to be met with resistance. He compared St. Lucia to another island of the same size, saying we could learn from it. Singapore is actually physically the same size as St. Lucia, with a population, a resident population of 4 million, but a daily population of 6 million, because it's right next to Malaysia. So there's a lot of people who live outside of Singapore and come to work. So 6 million people living in St. Lucia. Right? And I go around and when we talk about building a couple of more hotels or building a couple more buildings, and everybody's going, oh my God, don't change the island. Right? We have too much development. We haven't begun. And the, the key is, is how do we can create development without causing it to compromise our culture, compromise who we are, and, and at the same time to be successful and for it to be sustainable. Because all the things that we're going to talk about are going to cost money. So it's you know, good to have nice drawings, good to know where we're going to go, but the fundamental is how are we going to be able to get the monies. The PM said the current GDP is $1.7 billion and this is simply inadequate. The need to grow the GDP, he said, is a good thing because it highlights the importance of the changes to come. The idea of a country our size setting aside, I think it's 0.8% of its GDP for 12 years just is not feasible. It can't happen. Um, the, the monies that were supposed to go in one area are going to be taken away from a, from a different area. So the point of me making all of these things is that we need to empower ourselves. All right? We need to take what we're doing here very seriously. And while I'm incredibly grateful to all of the outside assistance in terms of modeling and everything else, ultimately this has to be homegrown. Because there's some very tough decisions that are going to have to be made. And they may be in conflict with some of the empirical evidence, but in terms of practical terms, what we have to be able to do because we must increase our GDP of our country. Chastney said the island's optimal GDP needs to be somewhere between 4 to $6 billion. Reporting for Hot 7 News, I'm Michelle Gonzalez. Despite the warnings put out by the Department of Fisheries regarding the closed season on lobsters and sea turtles, the department has found it necessary to reiterate the stiff penalties attached for slaughtering turtles and for lack of declaration of stone lobsters. Sea turtle fishery is closed from January to September every year. The law prohibits the harvesting, sale, purchasing and consumption of sea turtles, which includes the whole, any part of its byproducts, during the season. The closed season coincides with peak periods when sea turtles are reproducing and is established to allow the animals to mature and revive their populations. Fisheries biologist Alina Joseph says despite the many warnings, violations still persist. We've received several reports from the general public, persons, passerbys, persons um, along the beaches, indicating that they have witnessed illegal slaughtering of sea turtles. And the Department of Fisheries strongly encourages and advises the general public that they should not be slaughtering turtles while they're nesting on beaches. And anyone who, who sees or witness the illegal slaughtering of sea turtles are also encouraged to contact the Department of Fisheries by a telephone call, 725-1722 um, or 468-4135 to report any illegal slaughter. Information and Communication Officer in the Department of Fisheries, Yvonne Edwin, made a special plea to hoteliers to come forward with their declaration forms as the department notes a concerning level of non-compliance. We are urging and calling on all hotels food establishments, restaurants that sell lobster or advertise lobsters on their menu, that the declaration form, given the season has been closed, 
must be submitted to the Department of Fisheries. We will continue with our monitoring and surveillance as within the closed period, and we urge all hotels to ensure that they are in keeping with the regulations. The Department of Fisheries is appealing to the general public, fishers and vendors to adhere to the closed season regulations and to report to the Predial Larceny Unit, the Marine Police, the nearest police station, or the Department of Fisheries, anyone known to be in possession of sea turtles or its byproducts, meat, shell, or other parts during the closed season. The Executive Director of the Monsignor Patrick Anthony Folk Research Center, FRC, Hilary LaFosse, is calling on St. Lucians in particular to support the rebuilding fund launched on the first anniversary of the FRC fire. The center has been managing its affairs from its new temporary location at Barnard Hill, but LaForce says focus remains on returning to home base at Mount Pleasant. The Monsignor Patrick Anthony Folk Research Center FRC rebuilding effort is steady. But one year after the fire that gutted the cultural reservoir, the executive director says it's time to ramp up the thrust to make it back home. The one-year anniversary of the fire was on the 25th of March 2019 and the occasion was used to officially launch a rebuilding fund for the FRC. Executive Director Hilary LaForce says as part of its fundraising, the centre is gearing up for a big concert. For this, the first anniversary of that fire which was held on the site on the, uh, March 25th this year, we launched a rebuilding fund. And so we will be um, rebuilding our, our headquarters at Mount Pleasant and uh, we're hoping to have activities out there to show our presence there, continuous presence during the year before we actually rebuild that, uh, re-establish ourselves at Mount Pleasant. As a matter of fact, we are about to um, have a, a big fundraising drive. We are about having a show at the um, Pigeon Island National Park on June 9th and we're hoping that solutions will um, support it. LaForce says in the interim, the work of the FRC is continuing from its temporary base with a focus on rebuilding its cultural reserves. We have been continuing to uh, promote the cultural solution, and so we have started to rebuild our library, which is the major aspect of our work. We have obtained lots of um, books by persons who donated you know, the books, knowing of, the, of, the, of our situation, because we lost everything in our library. And so we are rebuilding our library, which is meant for persons to come in and understand the culture, do research, and uh, both students and uh, other people. This we have been facilitating over the years, particularly research by persons who overseas come in to do their master's degree and uh, even the doctorates and so on. And so that is going on quite, quite smoothly. Plans are also afoot for the staging of Creole Heritage Month, which will culminate with Jeune Creole. La Fosse expects another successful year for the cultural event that took a new format in 2018, where the FRC moved from having four host communities to having two host communities amid smaller fringe events across the island. You're watching the Hot 790 News. Stay with us. There's more coming up after the break.